Well, as far as the Supreme Court's judgment in the petitions challenging the wiries and the constitutionality of the Supreme Court Review of Judgments and Orders Act 2023 is concerned, before delving into the merits of the judgment, it is perhaps important to look at the provisions in the Constitution that pertain to the Supreme Court's jurisdiction. Now, under our constitutional dispensation, the Supreme Court has four dif- different and distinct forms of jurisdiction. The Supreme Court under our constitutional dispensation has original jurisdiction. There are certain cases that can originate in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court then has appellate jurisdiction because the Supreme Court has appeals from different high courts. It has appeals from different service tribunals and other tribunals. The Supreme Court then also has review jurisdiction where the Supreme Court may review certain orders and judgments which have been passed by the Supreme Court itself. And lastly, the Supreme Court also enjoys advisory jurisdiction where the President may solicit the Supreme Court's view or the Supreme Court's advice on certain important and critical issues. Now, it is important to recapitulate the Supreme Court's jurisdiction in the Constitution because it is perhaps unsurprising that the Supreme Court's jurisdiction cannot be enlarged by an ordinary legislation. Now, when we talk about judicial review or the power of the courts to strike certain provisions down or declare certain provisions of an ordinary law to be inconsistent with the constitution, we often think about the seminal case of Marbury v. Madison where the US Supreme Court held that an ordinary law could not enlarge the scope of the Supreme Court's jurisdiction or the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court which had been enshrined in the constitution. So I think it is unsurprising that the Supreme Court of Pakistan in this case held that the Supreme Court's jurisdiction could not be altered by an ordinary legislation. Now, admittedly, the federal legislative list does allow the parliament to enlarge the Supreme Court's jurisdiction. Nonetheless, my view in this matter is that such enlargement cannot come through an ordinary legislation and such enlargement cannot come through an ordinary legislation, especially where such ordinary legislation is inconsistent with the express command of the constitution. Now, as I said earlier, that the Supreme Court has four distinct forms of jurisdiction, and two of these forms are for, two of these forms of jurisdiction are of critical importance over here. So we saw that the Supreme Court has appellate jurisdiction on the one hand, and on the other, the Supreme Court has review jurisdiction. Now, both these juris- jurisdictions are distinct and they cannot be intermingled. So as far as the Supreme Court's review jurisdiction is concerned, the review jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is extremely limited in scope. And while hearing a case under its review jurisdiction, the Supreme Court cannot rehear the matter and the Supreme Court can only depart from its earlier ruling if the earlier ruling suffers from certain egregious illegalities or if there is a potential of a complete misadministration of justice if the early ruling is allowed to subsist. So as Justice Jackson of the US Supreme Court has had once said that the Supreme Court is not final because it is infallible but the Supreme Court is only infallible because it is final. So I would agree with the judgment in so far as the judgment concludes that it is important for litigation to end somewhere and perhaps giving the Supreme Court the appellate jurisdiction or perhaps passing a law which states that the Supreme Court's review that that the scope of the Supreme Court's review jurisdiction shall be the same as its advisory jurisdiction would not only open the floodgates of litigation but that would perhaps also obviate litigation from concluding. One more important aspect that has to be highlighted is that the Supreme Court's view in this case is consistent with a plethora of previous judicial decisions. So in the Mukhtar Amai case, for example, we also saw that the Supreme Court had highlighted that the review jurisdiction of the Supreme Court was extremely limited in nature. And as a result, enlarging the scope of the Supreme Court's review jurisdiction could have perhaps been done through a constitutional amendment, even if that amendment was unadvisable. But such jurisdiction cannot be enlarged through an ordinary legislation. So to this extent, I believe that the Supreme Court's judgment is in line with the Constitution and with the various pronouncements of the Supreme Court in the past. Having said that, it is not that there are no 
concerning or rather disconcerting aspects of the Supreme Court's judgment today. There are certain aspects of today's judgment that do raise certain concerns. So the Supreme Court, for example, in its judgment says that the rules that the Supreme Court has framed under Article 191 of the Constitution are perhaps at a higher pedestal than ordinary laws. Now, let us also bear in mind that the Supreme Court is yet to determine the constitutionality of the Supreme Court Practice and Procedure Act. The constitutionality of that act is yet to be determined. Nonetheless, insofar as the Supreme Court has, even in passing, suggested that the rules framed under Article 191 of the Constitution are at a higher pedestal, then ordinary legislation is perhaps a harbinger for things to come and perhaps is suggestive of where the Supreme Court is leaning as far as the constitutionality of the Supreme Court Practice and Procedure Act is concerned.